Intimidation, I don't care what anybody says, plays a big factor still in the league. I get excited after I score the goal. I mean, that's what uh, makes the hair on my neck stand up. Well, it's very scary every time you hear the word uh, cancer. It was very uh, emotional to get back on the ice. Seeing that everything was always an uphill battle, there were a lot of times where, you know, there were some muffled cries and, and mittens and things like that, or getting hit with a puck that, that hurt, and my brothers would give me that look like, uh, you cry, you're going home. Here is Shanahan, top of the circle. He's gone! I like to be exciting for the fans which we're playing for, because basically that's what we're doing, we're playing hockey for the fans. Have Elbury, shorthanded, break the way, as Mark said, we got a lot of pressure here, but I think that uh, we look we look to that as a motivator and we get excited about it. Blocked in front, three to score, Wayne Gretzky! It was a little bit scary because I thought at that time I'm never going to see my friends again. Sergei Federov, dance around a check, he's in, he shoots, he scores! People have to understand that my objective is winning every series or winning every game. Lifting up the Stanley Cup for the first time, was, it's a dream come true. When you talk about NHL power players, you might as well start at the top. Mark Messier and Wayne Gretzky are among the NHL's all-time superstars, with individual and team accolades unparalleled in the sport. October of 1996 marked the great Gretzky's debut as a member of the New York Rangers. Under the hot lights and bright spotlight of the Big Apple, Gretzky was joined by Ranger Captain Mark Messier at center ice, thus consummating a long-awaited reunion of two of the game's living legends, a duo that at one time was the core of one of the greatest teams in NHL history, the Edmonton Oilers of the 1980s. This powerhouse was shockingly dismantled when Gretzky was traded to Los Angeles. Promise, miss, I wouldn't do this. <laughs> but um, as I said, there comes a time when, when uh... there was a time when the Edmonton Oilers were the best team in hockey. Dynasty applies to few teams in sports, but the Oilers earned that title. From 1984 to 88, the Edmonton Oilers won four Stanley Cup championships. Wayne Gretzky and Marc Messier were the dominant players on a team loaded with superstars. Over a nine-year span, Gretzky and Messier combined for 885 goals, 2,416 points, and 14 All-Star Game appearances. They are 1-2 on the NHL all-time playoff scoring list. Coach and GM Glenn Sather orchestrated this juggernaut. And when Gretzky tallied an incredible 50 goals in the first 39 games of the 81-82 season, NHL hockey would never be the same. Coming into the league at that time it really changed the whole the way the whole game was played himself, and so Glenn had enough uh, smarts to really realize that to put the players with him that could skate. And the Oilers really kind of changed the way the game was played for for a long time. And uh, and I think because we were the first ones to do it, we really looked that much better than everybody else. For Wayne Gretzky, scoring records and Stanley Cup spread monumental expectations. So when he was traded to the struggling Los Angeles Kings, he was expected not only to win a cup, but to save the franchise. Remarkably, Gretzky led his overachieving Kings to the 1993 Stanley Cup Finals. And Zazzle takes the puck away from Robitaille. Robitaille gets it back center. As a member of the Kings, the Great One broke the most revered records in hockey. Kings are down 4-3, trying to tie this game up. Off the draw, here's Lowell with a minute to go in the game. Lowell cleared to the blue line, held in by Duchesne. Duchesne's pass in deep to Taylor, to Gretzky scores! He's done it! Wayne Gretzky, the Great One, has become the greatest of them all. The leading scorer in the history of the National Hockey League. Over time, coming in with Gretzky trailing. Gretzky gets the puck.
chant, Gretzky, Gretzky, Gretzky. Boy, I'll tell you, this guy has been something else, hasn't he? Oh. Meanwhile, Mark Messier had become the man in Edmonton. And given the task of winning without Gretzky, he did just that, leading the Oilers to their fifth Stanley Cup in 1990. Mark Messier, the ultimate captain. Mark is a natural leader. Some people are that way. And, you know, he just makes everyone around him feel part of the group, and he pushes people. Second guy's got a better puck. Can't turn away, gang. He's always positive, and he motivates, and he's always cheering for his teammates. Now we're going, boys. Now we're skating. Get that blue line, boys. Get that blue line defense. We can pass all the way. And yet, I mean, he'd be the first one to tell him, pull me aside and say, hey, you got to play better, you got to be better, you got to be stronger. I mean, that's good. I mean, when you respect someone, it's always nice to hear. Like his friend Gretzky, Messier's success in Edmonton didn't guarantee his future there. On the eve of the 91 season, Messier was shipped to the New York Rangers, a franchise that hadn't won the Stanley Cup since 1940. Once again, Messier became the heart of his team. With the Rangers down three games to two in the 94 Conference Finals to New Jersey, Messier boldly guaranteed victory. Kovalev moving in. Kovalev to Messier. Messier shot. Score! They tied the game! Mark Messier! And the bigger the game, the bigger Mark Messier plays. Leeds drops it. Kovalev again. Sam Rundle. Messier's Rangers went on to beat the Devils and then the Canucks for their first Stanley Cup in 54 years. And now their journey has come full circle. After eight years as NHL opponents, today these lifelong friends are Ranger teammates. Wayne Gretzky and Mark Messier, NHL superstars, New York Idols. It was a gut decision that I made that to accept less money and come to New York and have a chance to play with Mark again. At this point of our careers now, it's uh, it was expected of us back then to win, and I think here we are, how many years later, still expected to win. Again, their history of success translates to the highest expectations. In New York, the pressure to win is unique. Together, Wayne Gretzky and Mark Messier will shoulder the burden and try to recapture the glory they shared a decade ago. There's a ton of pressure here for people to do well and be successful. The main thing is winning and wanting to win. What a play! We look to that as a motivator and we get excited about it and I think that uh, we look forward to that challenge. In the end, that's all we're really playing for anyways, is to win. Two future Hall of Famers, together again for another run at hockey's ultimate prize. Five scoring titles, two Stanley Cups, the only player to ever win the Calder, Hart, Ross, Smythe, and Masterton trophies. In French, Lemieux means the best. Mario Lemieux has spent a lifetime living up to his name. The legend of Lemieux began in his junior days playing for the Laval Vassan of the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. The young Lemieux seemed to be a man playing among boys. In 1984, he set a record with 282 points in a season and was named the Canadian Major Junior Hockey Player of the Year. With this honor, the only place to go was up. Pittsburgh, the premier choix, the Pittsburgh, number 66, Mario Lemieux. Lemieux was the first pick overall in the 1984 NHL entry draft. The struggling Pittsburgh Penguins hoped he would live up to his pre-draft hype. Lemieux wasted no time proving himself. Here is Mario Lemieux, and he is off, racing it all alone. Lemieux, his first shot on goal, and he scores! Mario Lemieux, living up quickly to all the advertisements. Over his first eight years, Lemieux would average 127 points per season. In 1991 and 92, he delivered back-to-back -back Stanley Cups to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh Penguins win the Stanley Cup for the second consecutive year. During the Stanley Cup run, Lemieux suffered from a herniated disc in his back, but he fought through the pain to achieve his goal. 
In 1993, however, he was faced with an even greater challenge. Well, it's very scary every time you hear the word uh, cancer. Uh, and it's associated with yourself or your family. It's very scary. And to learn that uh, I had Hodgkin's disease and uh, that I was going to be a, uh, having to fight cancer for, for a few months or a few years. And, uh, you know, that was a tough time in my life. Lemieux underwent radiation therapy to try and beat this deadly disease. The treatments were successful, and the cancer went into remission. On March 2nd, 1993, Mario Lemieux returned to the Penguins lineup. Well, whether they were standing already or not, this is a standing ovation for Mario Lemieux here at the Spectrum. It's nice to see. His quest for a third consecutive cup was cut short as the effects of radiation and back pain took their toll. In 1994, Lemieux would make one of the most difficult decisions of his life. I have decided to take a one-year medical leave from the game of hockey. When I made the announcement, I uh, really thought that uh, my career was over. You know, one morning I uh, was playing with my daughter and I couldn't pick her up off the floor. And that's when I uh, stood back and, and uh, thought about my future. And I decided really to, uh, to start working out at that time uh, slowly and uh, getting my strength back. And that's when I started to think that uh, uh, maybe I could play this game again. Remarkably, Lemieux was back in uniform for opening night. It was very uh, emotional to get back on the ice, especially uh, after everything that I went through uh, last year. I was really anxious. I was counting the days down. The whole atmosphere during the day with the uh, players and, and be back and be part of uh, a team again. And it was very emotional. Lemieux was back, and that was not good news for opposing goaltenders. I certainly expected to come back here and be one of the best in the world. That's what I said when I started my comeback, but uh, I didn't want to come back and be an average player. Oh my goodness. Well, there's not another guy on earth that can do that. I was coming back to, to play at the level that I played uh, a couple years ago and, and uh, get back at the top of my game. Here's Lemieux trying to change it, and he scores! Now Lemieux, and there's number 500! Mario Lemieux has become the second fastest 500 goal scorer in National Hockey League history. If you're a hockey fan, you get a chance to see Mario Lemieux play this game. It's just incredible to watch. All the accolades pale in comparison to one gift, the gift of life. You know, everything happens in life for a reason. I'm very grateful that uh, I'm still around to uh, do the things that I love to do in this, in this world and uh, uh, hope to be around for, for a long time. In his youth, Sergei Fedorov was proclaimed as the next great Soviet center for the fabled and feared Red Army team. His dramatic defection and ultimate emergence as an NHL superstar has made Fedorov a hockey legend in both his homeland and his adopted country. Winner of the 1994 Hart Trophy is the league's most valuable player, and two-time Selkie Award winner is the NHL's best defensive forward. Fedorov brings an exuberance and joy to the game that rekindles memories of his early childhood in the former Soviet Union. I think I was three and a half, three, three years old. My mom took me to uh, skate mostly at nighttime. When I skated on that pond, I felt so, so much freedom, you know. That freedom found on the ice was unique behind the Iron Curtain, and it shielded Fedorov from the harsh realities of Soviet rule. I wasn't sure what it is all about, to be honest with you. I was very inexperienced, in, immature uh, young person who tried to learn hockey. And I was so excited to play this game. I was uh, loving it so much. And I didn't probably never cross my mind those kind of things, you know, intimidation, all that. The Soviet system was simple and understood. Collectivism was encouraged. Individualism was not. The state was the master of everyone's fate. And Sergei Fedorov became one of the many who toiled under the system. For most Russians, there was no escaping the suppression. But for the fortunate few athletes who were able to successfully defect, the NHL provided a welcome haven for them to demonstrate their skills and experience their freedom. In July 1990, Fedorov was in Portland representing the gold medal favorite Soviets at the Goodwill Games. A window of opportunity opened for him, 
Evaluating the risks, Fedorov stepped through it, leaving behind the only life he knew. So I came up to Jimmy Lights and I said, uh, probably Jimmy, let's go or something like that. That's a couple words I know only. You know, like we went uh, out of the back door. In 20 minutes, we were up in the air. I thought at that time, I'm never going to see my parents again. It was a little bit scary, a little bit exciting, probably more exciting than scary because I'm not going to be starving to death here. And I know I can play uh, a little bit of hockey, so I was willing to take some risk and some danger. come to me automatically because you got to do very quick things very quick uh, turns shots and this and that if it's clicking for me uh, I'm gonna do perfect and uh, it's gonna go through goalie never would stand a chance, you know. If I'm thinking too much, it's not going to click for me, you know. Here is Federer, look the head, he scores! There you go. There it is! Sergei Federer! Oh, my goodness! What a shot! Unbelievable wrist shot, unbelievable move! After you've done your job, you score a goal or made a great pass, you can relax for a few seconds and think about over how that happened. There at that point, that Kozlov is coming from behind him. Fedorov, meanwhile, a rush without the helmet. Fedorov, took down the straight, and Fedorov needs one. In 96, Fedorov led Detroit to an NHL regular season record 62 wins. The Stanley Cup, however, continues to elude them. But Fedorov's spectacular skills have elevated him to the most rarefied heights of his game. The freedom and joy he felt on that pond in Russia are still essential elements in the awesome arsenal of talent Fedorov commands today. His unique blend of talent and personality made Fedorov the ideal choice to be the first non-North American Nike spokesman. Um, he's very creative, and he's, uh, let's put it simply, a pain in the ass to play against. Jeremy had a great time. He hit me must be 18 times, once or twice. He smashed his face off the glass. So was Pretty fun to do. Whether deking or deflecting, Fedorov has become synonymous with excitement to hockey fans the world over. The former Soviet center Pretty cool, huh? is now a fashion-setting NHL superstar, enjoying his freedom and all the perks that go along with it. Fedorov's new teammate might be the piece that will solve their Stanley Cup puzzle. He's a coach's dream. Brendan Shanahan is that rare athlete who combines offensive skills with a passion for physical contact. Known around the league as a power forward, a big man who can be intimidating. Shanahan, the hot hand. A deadly shooter, Shanahan is a marksman with power who has twice topped 50 goals. And one thing about Brendan Shanahan, he's got one of the best shots in the league. His immense talent was showcased globally at the 96 World Cup. But it's Brendan's personality that makes him such a hit with the media. Breakaway in hockey is when a player goes one on one with the goalie. Shanahan! Oh, baby! See, they love me. Huh? That's a real picture. <laughs> yeah, that's a real picture. At least $500. Really? $500 that much? Yeah, I'm a big fan of his. Despite his celebrity, Shanahan's retained his humble sense of humor. It took me like a month to score my first goal. Uh, no. Yeah, it was really overdue. Drops to Shanahan, the shot he scores! First NHL goal for Brendan Shanahan. The guy came over to like kind of give me a little pat and go away to go. Like for him, it's just another goal for me. It was the first one in my career. I grabbed him by the head and kissed him. Brendan's self-deprecating style comes from growing up as the smallest child in a big family. 
I grew up the, the youngest of four boys and quite a bit younger too. Uh, it, it seemed that everything was always an uphill battle, whether it was getting my food first or uh, you know, running out, you know, being called for dinner and having to race up the stairs and, and someone was always grabbing me by the pant leg and yarding me down, climbing over top of me and everything was a battle. And, and when we played sports, I always wanted to play. When they were playing road hockey, you know, they didn't really take it easy on me. They kind of said, you, you can play, but if you play, there's no crying, no running home if you get hurt. So there are a lot of times where, you know, there were some muffled cries and, and mittens and things like that or getting hit with a puck that, that hurt. And my brothers would give me that look like, uh, you cry, you're going home. Brendan matured quickly while living out a Canadian dream. He developed his game in major junior hockey and at age 18 broke through to the NHL. Four years later, he was playing with his idols in the 91 Canada Cup. dressing room I remember taping a stick and that realizing this you know before our first game and looking around and seeing like Wayne Gretzky, uh, Mark Messier, Paul Coffey, uh, guys like that stretching, taping sticks and you know about to go out and put on the same sweater as, as me and I was about to play on their team so uh, I remember like getting really nervous and um, you know it was thrilling. Shanahan provided some thrills of his own in the 96 World Cup as the leading scorer for Team Canada. Shanahan shoots scores! Shanahan ties the game! What a rocket! A classic power forward, Shanahan is a warrior who never shies away from the physical game. You gotta do whatever it takes to win, and that means you know, take a one for the team, you've got to do that. And if it means addition one out, you've got to do that as well. In a shocking result, Team USA upset Canada to win the inaugural World Cup. Despite the painful loss, Brendan can still laugh about hockey and his early attempts to trace the roots of the game. I did a project of grade two. I did some research and it was the Iroquois Indian. The Iroquois Indians were playing uh, playing uh, ice hockey, you know, at the time on the St. Lawrence River, they had like skates, like bones for skates, and they had these sticks and were hitting this rock, or I don't think it was a puck back then, but they were yelling. Uh, <laughs> this is, this, I wrote this in a project, I got a good mark, but they were yelling, hokey, which in their uh, native uh, meant, uh, it hurts. <laughs> That's. I mean, somebody might look this up and say I'm insane, or somebody might look it up and say he's right, but that's, I remember distinctly having that in my project, and I don't think my imagination is that great that I would have made it up, so uh, it was hokey or something like that, which meant that uh, it hurts. For Chicago native and Blackhawk defensive superstar Chris Chelios, the inaugural World Cup of Hockey will always be remembered fondly. Playing for your country, you know, playing against other countries, especially Canada with the pride they have in their hockey. Uh, it got a little emotional. It was as competitive as the Stanley Cup. I'd say it was just as competitive as playing for the Stanley Cup. And in a short-term tournament like that, I thought it was great. With Chelios leading a rock-solid defense and Mike Richter providing impenetrable goaltending, Team USA skated to a perfect 4-0 record. And this country began to take notice. The people that play hockey in our general fan base will tell you it's the best hockey they've ever seen. And uh, you know, after watching a few of the tapes, I really believe it. In game one of the World Cup Finals against Canada, Team USA was 10 seconds away from suffering its first loss when lightning struck. One back to Leach and a save, Joseph Rebound scores! But the celebration was short-lived. In overtime, Steve Eisenman's goal put Canada one win away from the World Cup Championship. It seemed the clock had struck midnight for Team USA. We put ourselves in a pretty bad situation. I don't think if you ask anybody in the team after that game, we had a chance to go up to Montreal and beat them two games. We knew we were in for a battle with them. The Molson Center in Montreal would be the site for game two, and if necessary, game three. With the title on the line, both teams and countries dug in for the second game, a contest fiercely fought for the right to be called world champion.
The World Cup of Hockey was down to one game. Tied after two periods, Canada looked to end the U.S. challenge. But it's put for the shot. But then, with under four minutes to play, Team USA opened the floodgates. Waiting for it is Lee. Shoots one to play. Brett scored the goal, you know, we, we tied it and everybody's excited. Tony scored the goal, it was just kind of, everybody's in shock. And, you know, I guess it was just meant to be. It happened so quick and in a matter of four or five minutes and there we were carrying the cup. You know, we're pretty proud of the 25 guys that we were in the coaching staff that were involved in that. It's something special and we'll share that for a long time. And that was maybe the last time we played against players like Gretzky, you know, Messier, Coffey, those guys. And to me, that is the tournament to be in. It's the best tournament. And, uh, you know, to beat them, I. I I was really proud of that. It, it was right up there with winning the Stanley Cup. And Chris should know. In 1986, just his second full season, Chelios teamed up with rookie Patrick Waugh and helped the Montreal Canadiens to their 22nd Stanley Cup. He spent seven years in Montreal before being traded to the Blackhawks. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, Chris had become a hockey fanatic 20 years earlier in the Windy City. Every kid wanted to play hockey back then, or everybody wanted to be Dick Butkus. And I couldn't be Dick Buckus, so I decided uh, to play hockey. I think that youth hockey was really competitive. We played against other states and, and traveled quite a bit. Chicago's got some great youth hockey now. And it's that youth hockey which keeps Chris traveling to the Chicago suburbs these days to see the next generation of Chelios play. Jake, age five, and Dean, age seven. All right, here's his chance right here. Here he goes, he's gonna score. Oh! He got a little Jake gets out there, he's a clown. A goof. Come on, Dean. Good play. Jake yeah, keeps coming on the ice. He ain't supposed to be on the ice. <laughs> he keeps sneaking on. Just starting out, Jake and Dean are having the time of their young lives, sharing something they love with a father who's regarded by many as the best U.S.-born hockey player ever. Seven-time NHL All-Star, Chelios continues to study his opponents. I'm going to do a little vintage Mario move. Watch this. Fourth shooter, Chris Chelios. He scores. Oh, I know that. I watched you all get all this stuff going. Great play, Chelios. That's why he is a Norris Trophy candidate. And three-time winner as the league's best defenseman. Oh, boy. First of all, I'm going to thank my wife, Tracy, for the first time because I forgot the other times, and when I did remember, I never won it, so. A class act off the ice, this Dr. Jekyll turns into Mr. Hyde on skates. I'd rather watch a highlight of me just clotheslining somebody than scoring a goal. You know, it's a great feeling. I guess it's like a, a, a fighter and a knockout punch. Everybody would rather see the big hit. Intimidation, I don't care what anybody says, plays a big factor still in the league. Oh, Chelios hammered a man in the corner. Chicago, that, they're known for their aggressiveness and their, their toughness, and that's that's how I wanted to be known for. Here's Bell Mary for Detroit. Defending the Chicago shooter, but Chris Chelios has set. And Marty tries to run Chelios, and Chelios got a glove on. I'd much rather cut someone in half than, than score a goal any day. I wouldn't say he's that tough. His younger sister used to beat the heck out of him when they were little. <laughs> she always used to compete with him and always used to come out ahead. <laughs> Chris's hockey career has come full circle. Opening Chelly's Chili Bar in his hometown is one way of keeping touch with his fans. As for the most popular item on the menu... This is the best chili in the world. Right here. With the best name on it, too. Well, when we win, I come here after the games, and if we, uh, if we lose, I don't show up. My parents run the place, and it's a fun place. It's basically just a hockey crowd. You know, I think the people enjoy seeing the players after the game here. Thank you very much. When the kids come, it's not often the kids get a chance to meet the Blackhawks. I know I never did when I was a kid, so this is a great spot for them to meet the players. Good luck, buddy, huh? Chris is great. He would never turn down a kid, and he gets a bigger kick out of watching a kid get, you know, that gleam in their eyes than anything. That means more to him than winning games or uh, scoring goals. Kids mean a lot to him. Yeah. Played well. well. At least we're winning, huh? Yeah. Winning 
on and off the ice. Brett Hall is a scoring machine for the St. Louis Blues, averaging 60 goals a season in the 1990s. He and Chris Chelios shared in the glory of USA's World Cup championship. But when they put their NHL uniforms on, Hall spends the entire game trying to outfox the captain of the Blackhawks. And they draw the Hawks out, bounce to the side of that. Hall picked out of midair. He can beat Chelios to it, and then Brett Hall was there behind him. I'll never try to embarrass anybody. I won't pump my arms or uh, jump like Mike Foligno or things like that. If I'm doing those things in Chris Chelios, uh, after I score, is thinking in his mind, oh, oh, you know, what, what's he doing out there embarrassing me or running the score up? I don't need me on his mind. You know, uh, you know, that's why I tell the coaches after I score, I like to have a new line out there right away just to get me out of everyone's mind. So next time when I go out there, Chris Chelios isn't going, there he is, you know, there he is over here. He's just playing his game, and then I just come in again, and all of a sudden I'm there again. Hall has been outsmarting NHL defenses for a decade, winning the 91 MVP and three goal-scoring titles. No one shuts down the golden bread. Does a spin, works it alone, shoots, he scores! He's amazing, folks. He is incredible. Oh, baby, what a play. I get excited after I score the goal. I mean, that's what uh, makes the hair on my neck stand up. Break away for Hull. He's two men short. He's in. Hull, the shot, he scores! What a turn of events. Brad Hull. Brett's amazing talent comes from a superior gene pool. His father, Bobby Hall, was the most exciting player of the 1960s, streaking down the left wing for the Chicago Blackhawks. In front again, here's Bobby Hall. Oh! Michael ties it up. Bobby Hall scores. But trying to follow in the steps of a superstar was no easy task. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer. He was the greatest player of, uh, or one of the greatest players of his generation. Uh, and you just, as a kid, to live up to something of that uh, nature is impossible. And, 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 you know, kids can be cruel. And it was, uh, at times, very difficult, not only for me, but for uh, uh, my brothers. And, and I think that's probably one of the main reasons uh, I'm the only one who, who made it. I just went on my own course. I went out and just uh, had fun playing. And I said, if I make it, I make it. Uh, but I'm going to have fun trying. Fans have always had fun cheering the halls. Just like Bobby before him in Chicago, Brett is adored in St. Louis. The Hall is shot, he scores! Oh, what a shot from the slot, Brett Hall! And they go wild here at Kiel. 500 of Hall's devoted fans showed up for this midweek autograph session. The city has adopted its number one star. From day one when I got here, the people have treated me like I was born and raised here. He makes St. Louis, you know, something. Instead of most of these cities, you don't have no big stars, really. And he makes St. Louis pretty much stick out. Every time I've seen him, he's been really polite and great guy. We need guys like him, more of them. And why do you like Brett Hull so much? I don't know. He's just my idol. I just, I don't know. He's just your idol, huh? They fall in love with their players, and as long as those players go out and play hard and entertain them, uh, and do good things for them in the community, they'll come out and support you, win, lose, or tie. Uh, hi, guys, how are you? How are you, Tully? Thank you. As usual, Brett encountered a packed house, but he didn't stop signing until every fan left with a smile on their face. A father himself, Brett has passed the Hall bloodline to his son, Jude. Could there be another Hall destined for the NHL? Well, right now, it looks like he could play almost any sport he wants with the ability he has. So, uh, you know, whatever he wants to do, I'm going to try to. Uh, uh, he's going to be raised here in St. Louis, and uh, uh, hopefully, he can uh, come and strap on the blue note one day. He shoots and scores! Oh, baby! Hall does it again! No one can get NHL fans out of their seat faster than Pavel Bure. Ever since he stormed into the league as a teenager in 1991, Bure has become hockey's greatest entertainer. Yeah, that's what I think about myself, you know. I try to be excite, you know, exciting player for the fans which we're playing for. Because basically that's what we're doing, we're playing hockey for the fans. For to Bure again, looking for the ex-devil Greg Adams, number eight. He was at the hash marks, now Bure works his way. 
When he's in top gear, Pavel Bure is a blur on the ice. Look at Bure flying, and here comes Bure. Look at him go. Given for Bure one on one with Zubov. Zubov in front. Bure the move. Bure the backhand. Bure tried to draw it. One and scores. As soon as he let Bure go, the problem began for the New York Rangers because he exploded around Zubov. I think it's really important for my game when uh, sometimes I'm just feel I'm flying there. Speed is a big part of the Russian Rockets' lifestyle, including the cars that he drives. I think I drive pretty fast, but, you know, I still try to stay with the legal speed. I think I pass more people than passed me. I just enjoy to drive this car every day. It's pretty fast. You know, it's a V12, and uh, I got a lot of room inside when my friends come in, in town and see me. It's really comfortable because you can operate the car just with one with one hand, and it's really smooth and comfortable. And uh, I also have a that car, red Ferrari, and uh, you know I choose a red because I think uh, Ferrari is supposed to be red. That's the color of Ferrari. It's more like a toy, I think, for me. You know, I don't drive every day. Sometimes when it's sunny, and uh, it's a really fast car, and it's a sport car, and just a fun to drive. The Bure fascination with speed runs in the family. His father, Vladimir, who trains Pavel in Vancouver, was a three-time Olympic swimming medalist for the Soviet Union. Vladi intended to raise another swimmer, but young Pavel had different aspirations. He always asked me, Dad, I want to be a hockey player. I said, oh, you're a swimmer. But he always asked me, oh, I want to go to the hockey school. Can you put me in a program? And I decide, why not? Pavel's passion for hockey helped him enter the elite Red Army program. From Moscow, he made the leap to the NHL, where he's carved out an impressive legacy. 1992 Rookie of the Year and consecutive 60-goal seasons. Speed is one thing, but being able to handle the puck with the speed, that's another thing. Bure's amazing run through the 1994 playoffs brought the Canucks within a single goal of the Stanley Cup. I got here, uh, I heard a lot about Stanley Cup. Wow, we gotta win Stanley Cup, but you can't understand till you you get there. So now I know how it feels to be even in the final. You know, I don't think we could get any closer. We lost Stanley Cup by one goal. The seven came and the three two. And it was really disappointing for us. A year and a half later, Pavel faced another disappointment, a career threatening knee injury. I think it would be happens 10 years ago, I would be would be over for me. I wouldn't be able to play hockey anymore. I guess it's the worst, worst time in his uh, hockey life. But with the help of his father and today's technology, Bure willed his shredded knee back into playing shape. It was, uh, it was a really tough time for me, but you know I'm really happy I came back and I'm playing the, the game which I love. But questions lingered prior to the 96-97 season. Would Bure be the same electrifying performer? The critics got their answer in a preseason game against Boston. Here goes Bure. Pavel Bure, shorthanded, breakaway, score! Now we're all going to want to watch this replay, and we still won't believe it. Unbelievable. The Russian Rocket, back at full speed in Vancouver. When the Quebec Nordiques became the Colorado Avalanche, the Stanley Cup playoffs seemed a reasonable goal. But no one could have imagined that at the end of the 96 season, Lord Stanley's Cup would be hoisted over the heads of these players. At the center of this group, perhaps the least surprised of all, stood Patrick Waugh, one of the fiercest competitors in NHL history. Winning a championship was hardly new to Waugh, but what made this one so sweet was the feeling of self-satisfaction. Growing up in Quebec, playing for the Nordiques was his dream, but it was not his fate. At age 18, he was drafted by the Montreal Canadiens. When you get to the NHL, you know, the chance to be drafted, uh, you don't care anymore where you're going to end up. And, and if there's a place probably you would love to end up because of the, uh, the tradition of the team, the dynasty of the team, uh, it's Montreal. 
Here comes Sandstrom. He should go oh. save. What a save by Patrick Watt. Mullen trying to keep it in. A shot. Loose back in front. Oh, Patrick Watt's got it. He's a good goalie, this guy. Waugh's first season in goal for the Canadiens earned him his first Stanley Cup. When we won the Cup, it was like, I don't know, it's something that could happen every year. And, and it was kind of funny to me, for me to see the guys like Larry Robinson and Craig Ludwig like, grab each other and tears in, in their eyes. And I was like, wow. In 93, when the Canadiens made it back to the Stanley Cup Finals, this three-time Vezina Trophy winner as the league's top goaltender refused to be distracted from his goal. It's probably the only, the, the first time I, when somebody said you were in the zone. Goes over the line, now the pass, rebound, Wall made a big save. The Canadians have three of the money shot here, and Wall got his one and he's on. The Sands are coming very close. The will of Wall and the clutch play of the Canadiens were too much for Los Angeles, as Montreal defeated the Kings in five games. Once again, this extraordinary champion experienced hockey's ultimate moment. I always learned something from Montreal, and it was winning. Because I think playing in NHL, that's what, that's what it's about. It's winning the Stanley Cup, and at least have a crack at it every year. Patrick would not be able to relive that magic in Montreal. On December 6, 1995, he was traded to Colorado. The Avalanche were happy recipients of this goaltending phenomenon. Number 33, Patrick Wall. The former rival brought a new bravado and sense of confidence that was infectious to his teammates. Just got that attitude that, uh, you know, we're going to win. And, and you just can't take that away from, from, from a guy like that. And, and, and when he brings that out and, and the rest of us, uh, we, we're a pretty tough team to beat. Patrick Watt, as you know, we've found out, has that air about him. Patrick Watt was the legend. Distance from the scrutiny and dissection of the Montreal microscope, Colorado provided Waugh with a fresh start. <laughs> Relaxed and rejuvenated, Patrick regained focus on the ice. And as the 96 playoffs began, it was a familiar, confident Waugh. Yeah, it should have been a penalty shot, there's no doubt about it. Um, I like Patrick's quote that he would have stopped me. I just want to know, just want to know where he was in game three. I can't really hear what Jeremy says because I got my two Stanley Cup rings plug in my ear. <laughs> Armed with his inner spirit, Wall returned to his rightful place, the Stanley Cup Finals. Against the Cinderella Florida Panthers, Waugh's postseason experience proved invaluable, allowing only four goals as the Avalanche swept the first three games. Round down for a throw behind Garbagall. Play out there for Garbagall going in. One down, rebound, another shot. Waugh stopped the ball. Boy, thank God they scored two because they would have to leave with uh, their rat in their pocket or in their hand, and <laughs> it would be sad for them. Game four was an epic battle as the much-anticipated goaltending duel between Waugh and John Van Beesbrook finally materialized. After 60 minutes of exhilarating hockey, both goalies were still perfect. The game would go into triple overtime as neither goaltender was willing to relent. One hundred four minutes into the game, Yui Krupp's slap shot escaped Van Beesbrook, and Patrick Waugh was once again a Stanley Cup champion. Come on! Colorado wins! Congratulations, Paul. Congratulations, Paul. Congratulations. 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 Congratulations
Congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. How are you today? I'm doing great. Uh, not as well as you guys are doing. Yes, we're having a great time here. We're all feeling pretty good. This team works very hard to achieve uh, the goal of the Stanley Cup, and uh, we certainly wish you the best come this November. Well, I'd like to have a sweep like you did. <laughs> <laughs> we heard that uh, you finally break 80, and we just want to congratulate you on the golf course. <laughs> Waugh's third championship cemented his place among hockey's goaltending elite. My objective is winning every series or winning every game, and I will do everything possible to win games if I feel it's important, if I have to do it. And I, I got a lot of confidence in myself because I know I can go out there and, and produce, uh, and, and I'm not scared to do everything that, that's, that's going to help us to win. There's only one way to be known as a winner if is if you win the Stanley Cup. And uh, as soon as you win the Stanley Cup, your name is on the cup. There's nobody will take that away from you. And uh, people will always remember you as a winner. Also inscribed on the cup is the name of the Avalanche offensive star and team captain. From the sun-drenched scenic mountains of Colorado, an unassuming hero has emerged in the mile-high city of Denver. This is the story of a quiet, soft-spoken NHL Stanley Cup champion. Joe Sackick, whose life and career seem to have risen to their summit since the Quebec Nordiques franchise moved west. Everybody was excited about uh, the news that we were moving to Denver. Uh, we heard so many good things about this city and uh, we moved here a month before training camp just to get used to it and uh, um, you know, we just loved it. There's so much to do here. Uh, more importantly, I think uh, the way we, we were treated uh, from not only the fans but, but all, the, all the people here in, in Denver. Uh, it was amazing because everybody's so nice and uh, it just made us feel uh, real welcome. Joe Sackick has come a long way from his days growing up in his quiet hometown of Burnaby, British Columbia on the outskirts of Vancouver. It was here the seeds of a budding NHL All-Star were planted. We always played hockey as kids and uh, always watched Hockey Night in Canada. Back then my friend was always Mark Messi and I was Wayne Gretzky so uh, um, we had our battles and that's uh, usually the two we were and uh, I still remember those days we'd always uh, jump the fence to get into school and uh, get bring the nets over and, and play every, every Sunday. Well I guess as a kid you always dream about playing uh, pro hockey but once I got to junior I really got to work on the skills and, and things like that because we're on the ice every day. It got tiring near the end of the year we weren't used to it but uh, it was well worth it. From the Colorado Avalanche, number 19, Joe Sackett. Joe's boyhood dreams became reality by becoming a five-time NHL All-Star and being named to the Canadian World Cup team. But success did not come overnight. In Sackick's eight NHL seasons, he's emerged from quiet rookie to NHL superstar. Even now, I'm not really that vocal in the dressing room. Uh, when things have to be said, I'll, I'll say it. But uh, over the years, I uh, really started to work harder in practice and, and try and lead by example. Sackick beats one man, beats another guy. Here he comes. Joe Sackick's quiet confidence helped the Avalanche steamroll into the 1996 Stanley Cup playoffs as the team and their captain looked to change the fortunes of the franchise in the postseason. We knew it was going to be tough, and, and it was more mentally than anything. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on us and uh, uh, to get by the first round. Uh, the franchise hadn't done that in a long time, and uh, uh, to get by that, uh, uh, it, it really uh, calmed us and relaxed us for the next series. League leading 18 playoff goals and adding 16 assists. Sackick was named the Conn Smythe Trophy winner as the playoffs' most valuable player. But Joe's modesty prevents him from basking in the spotlight. Obviously, uh, things went well for me in that playoffs, but I think uh, uh, that doesn't happen if, if we don't have the team we had. Uh, we had right uh, a solid team uh, right from goaltending on and uh, a great coaching staff. and. Uh, I think everybody was playing uh, their best hockey at the right time, and, and that was the difference. Uh, it wasn't just one player or one or two guys. Uh, 
It was a total combined team effort. Use our brain, you cannot skate with us. Nearly three minutes played in the second period. Colorado has started to take over and moving into second. Joe Sackick and his teammates realized a dream come true. A dream born in the heart of a child. As you know, you, you always uh, think as a kid what it'd feel like, but you really don't know. And uh, uh, it, it's lifting up that Stanley Cup for the first time. It was, it's something, it's, it's a dream come true. You finally have accomplished what you dreamed of.